Perfect. Well, welcome uh, today to our um, webinar podcast that we're doing here. Uh, we're going to talk about um, potential uh, home buyers and how they can be able to start on the right track. We have an agent here with us today, and we're going to uh, introduce ourselves in just a couple minutes. Um, we'll go through and, and just kind of ask some questions, have some Q&A, have an organic conversation about the things that we want to discuss. Uh, we're hoping not to take more than 60 minutes today, uh, depending on your questions uh, and what you have. Um, just go ahead and put them in the box and we can be able to get to those. Uh, if this takes shorter time than 60 minutes, that's fine. We just wanna make sure we have really good information for you and we'll spend as much time as we need to on that. So. Uh, we'll wait just another uh, 60 seconds to see if we have any stragglers um, come in and then I'll go through and I'll introduce myself and we'll introduce our guest today and uh, and how we can be able to go through and answer some questions. Real quickly, James, are they able to see the site right now on there? Okay. So as people are coming in, there's a site that you can be able to see. This is a joint venture with Derek. Uh, our guests today and the credit union and how you can be able to shop for homes. We'll talk about this a little bit more in detail and talk about the technology and how that's helping home buyers. Um, we'll go through and address those. So real quickly on the questions, if you have any questions, no matter how silly you may think they are, uh, please answer or ask them. If they're extremely specific, that's fine. Uh, put them up there. We'll go through and we'll answer those. If you have any follow-up questions on that, your name will pop up when the question pops up so we can be able to see if it's the same individual. Uh, if we need to uh, touch base after, uh, we'll go through and uh, we'll give our information and how you can be able to get in touch with us so that you can be able to uh, have a conversation if we need to. Sometimes um, the item that you're asking about is so specific that we do need to have a conversation, which we're more than happy to do that. So I'll get started. My name's Taylor Riley. I am a mortgage consultant here with uh, you first credit union. I've been at the credit union for almost nine years. I've worked in the financial sector for almost 20 years, uh, focusing on mortgages over the last decade. Uh, it's something that I have um, a lot of passion for. I really enjoy it, being able to help people uh, with their most important purchase that they'll ever make in a home uh, is something that I, I uh, love to do, uh, to meet with people, talk through their scenarios. There are thousands of scenarios that people are going through and sometimes there's just a little difference that can make a big difference. So we wanna make sure that we are there to be able to help you. Uh, one of the things that I love most about working at the credit union is uh, they always really want us to do what's best for the member. And so uh, with that, I'll introduce Derek Power. He's a realtor who works in the Valley. As I said, we have a joint venture with here. And one of the things that I really love about working with Derek is that he has the same mantra that I do. We just wanna do what's best for for our clients and being able to get them to taken care of. Derek, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do um, and how long you've been in the industry. And and uh, yeah, we'll start with that stuff. Sure, thanks Taylor. Yes, my name's Derek Power. I am a realtor with Exit Realty Success. I've been in the industry for over 12 years. I actually got into uh, real estate during the recession. So when everybody was getting out, mm -hmm. I jumped in. Nice. And I absolutely love being a realtor. Uh, what, I, what I guess I love most about it is getting to really understand the individuals that I'm helping, really understand what their goals, what their dreams are, and then uh, do everything that I can to help them to accomplish those goals and dreams. In fact, I was out to dinner with some people the other day and somebody uh, heard me uh, mention that I was a realtor and they said, Derek, what do you specialize in? Do you specialize in helping buyers, uh, sellers? Are, are you commercial? Are you residential? And, and I looked at him and I said, I specialize in exceptional service. <laughs> That's my passion. So I, I do help buyers, I do help sellers, I do help investors, I kind of do it all. Uh, but my commitment uh, to the people that I work with and work for, and I know Taylor shares this commitment as does the U First Credit Union, is uh, that we will serve. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I agree with that, that you uh, do excel with service. And that's that's what uh, one of the reasons, if not the main reason that I really do love working with you, also your knowledge on on real estate. So let me ask a question with that piggybacking off what you just talked about. So 
how does a realtor help a buyer? What is the purpose of a realtor? What is the realtor there to be able to do? Sure. I mean, uh, obviously, if you're going to be making an investment in a in a home, and in in Salt Lake County, what the average price or the median price of a single family home is around six hundred thousand dollars, you're going to want to surround yourself with an exceptional team, uh, a realtor, a lender, et cetera. Uh, a realtor's role on that team is is going to be to guide you through that process of uh, identifying and finding a home and then negotiating the contract on that home. A good realtor will take the time uh, as you begin that process to really educate you on the current real estate environment. Uh, that's important up front so that during that process when you need to make certain decisions, you're prepared to do so. Um, I probably, for me, one of the most important things that a realtor can help do for you is remove emotion. I, a lot of people want to not have a realtor. They just want to do it themselves. And I'll tell you right now, if I was looking for a home, maybe out of state, knowing as much as I do in real estate and having been involved in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of transactions, I would hire a realtor. Mm -hmm. Because when you are buying a home or selling a home and it gets to that point where where you're negotiating with the other person um, your emotions can actually do you a disservice mm -hmm. so having somebody working for you who is not emotionally invested in the transaction but who can fight for you and for what's important to you and to your family I think that's key. So those are some of the reasons why I think having a realtor is really beneficial, leveraging their experience, leveraging their knowledge, mm -hmm. le leveraging their understanding of the market. Yeah. Uh, much the same as why you'd want to have a good lender. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think about my own journey that I've had as, home, as a homeowner is that uh, having a realtor was monumental for my wife and I when we were buying our first home. And we personally know uh, the realtor and his wife and his family. And then I kind of got to this point where I was like, well, what does a realtor really do? Like I can search for homes online and everything like that. And that when I first started to really just do mortgages, that was my thought process on it, is that the realtor is part of the team, but not really that important. And then that has changed drastically where that's one of the first questions when I go through and I talk to people is, do you have a realtor? What's your relationship with the realtor? Not to steer them to somebody else, but just to understand um, their emotional connection with the realtor and what's going on there. Do they trust that person? Uh, the last thing that I tell people when I meet with them is that you need to trust your realtor. You need to tr trust your loan officer 100%. If you don't trust them or have any inkling of uncomfortability, you need to bounce that loan officer. You need to be including myself or bounce that realtor. Just because this is such a big transaction, you wanna make sure that you have people there uh, who you trust to be able to go through and help you out. So Derek, what, what different or what makes you different? I know that you do some things. I wanted to give you this platform to be able to talk to people real quickly about what you do different than most realtors at the beginning. And then once they are under contract, so you, they can be able to see the value that you bring. Sure, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, right off the bat, initially when I'm uh, meeting with somebody, I like to sit down with them in person. Uh, I like to do that either at my office or at their home or, or somewhere where they're comfortable. And I really uh, want to take time to get to know them. Uh, what's important to them? Listen, everybody's goals are different. Everybody's needs are different. And if I am going to truly serve you, I need to understand what those are. So it's an opportunity for me to get to know them. It's also an opportunity for them to get to know me mm -hmm. because, and you just mentioned it, it's really integral that they know that they have a person on their team that they can trust 100%. Mm -hmm. um, during that meeting, uh, in addition to talking about their goals and talking about their dreams, I really want to educate them on the current market environment. It's always changing. Uh, what's happening today uh, in in real estate is different than what was happening a year ago, is different than what was happening the year before that, and it's gonna be different in a couple months. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's always changing. But I want to be sure that they have a financial foundation uh, that they can then work from as we're working together. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, right off the bat, I, I want to take the time uh, to do that. Uh, we also, in that meeting, will talk about the home buying process and also the home selling process because mm -hmm. sometimes people are doing both yeah. simultaneously. 
And uh, I know for a lot of people, they've already purchased a home or maybe they've already sold a home. Um, but again, uh, things are changing. And it's really, really important that everybody's sort of on that page. Uh, it will it will serve them down the road. So that's that's right off the bat what I like to do with people. I am a full time realtor, uh, so I am always available, <laughs> uh, except for on Christmas. Yeah. The only day. <laughs> but I think I have even worked on that particular yeah. day. Um, but I also want to be available. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, that's that's kind of a, a little bit of my approach. But honestly, I think as we continue to talk, uh, you know, during this this podcast, mm -hmm. uh, people get an idea of what makes me different. Yeah. I'd rather spend time on the subject than on myself. Mm -hmm. um, but if people want to give me a call, I'm happy to talk yeah. about me all day long. <laughs> so one of, one of the things I've actually sat down with you a few times when you've met with people to understand what you're doing uh, with them in those meetings and just kind of be a fly on the wall. Um, it was very similar to what I like to do when I meet with people. So I want to make sure that we're staying in front of the eight ball as much as possible. We want to stay ahead of the curve and anything that we can be able to do right now is going to benefit us in the future. So I like to sit down with people for an hour uh, at the beginning. If they only have 20 minutes to be able to give me, that's fine. Whether we do it through Zoom or we do a phone call, I like to have all parties present. So I'm just not talking to a spouse or or uh, you know if you're if your parents are going to be giving money and they want to be involved in this like i want to have the conversation with them too and just have everybody there to be able to go through these are the steps find out where you're at what you're trying to accomplish and then we can be able to work on that path uh then afterwards they meet with you you kind of do the same thing you help them with the market you help them ask them what their goals are what they're trying to accomplish and really make sure that we have from a financial side, what needs to be done, and then from finding a home side, what needs to be got, done. And then those merge together organically, really, to right. have a good experience for people, right? All right, so um, let me ask you this question, um, because we have this up on the screen right now. What tools are available today uh, to help home buyers that have not been available in the past? Have there been some monumental change or something that's been out there to say, or that you can point to and say, this is really helping people that wasn't available 15, 20 years ago. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the internet. I mean, that's huge. Uh, I, I remember my parents looking for a, a home uh, when we moved here from Connecticut back in the 80s. And they made a stop at Harmons and picked up a bunch of cheap newspaper type magazines. And that's what they were oh, looking for homes. Interesting. I mean, but, but the, I mean, we're going way yeah. back then, but, but the internet has been a huge um, game changer for people. It gives it gives everybody information right at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. And then along with that, um, a lot of the new applications that are becoming available on people's phones. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it that's probably the biggest tools that are available to people. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I mean, sometimes those tools are are a good thing, and sometimes yeah. they're also a dangerous thing yeah. though because sometimes people think that they they know it all and they can see it all and they can figure it all out all by themselves mm -hmm. just using the internet yeah uh, and that can also get you into a little bit of trouble i don't want to go down that path but but i will say that the internet has been a huge tool for consumers i agree i i think about my own pro my own um uh, process through this and being a homeowner the first time i bought a home was in 2006 so it was searching for a home online was how we've done it. It seems like over the last 17 years since I bought a home in 2006, there's a lot of tools that seem to be the same tools that are being used. It's just that the pictures are a little bit nicer. Maybe there's some videos that they are able to show. There's a little bit more pizzazz sure. to the listing than there had been in the past. But overall in searching for a home and stuff like that, that seems to be a constant in what you can be able to do. Yeah and what's available for you. One uh, of the, okay. if I can interrupt, one of the one of the things that I do think has changed a little bit is some of the sites have become somewhat more dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, our shared website, the one that you have on the screen, uh, does allow people to create searches uh, uh, in specific areas or specific yeah. communities or yeah. specific neighborhoods that will automatically send them updates of homes mm -hmm. that have been listed uh, it allows them to save those. It allows them to email those to friends or family. So there are some there are some improvements that way. Even though we had the internet before, 
uh, often you'd have to go into the internet and redo your search every time. So things have improved that way. Um, I, I would agree with that. I know that you, my wife wanted to move a few years ago. We met with you and went through that. She still gets those updates. I know. Where they'll come out, she'll be like, oh, we've, you know, we've decided that we don't want to, well, I, I thought we had decided that we don't, but she's still constantly looking. She's <laughs> like, oh, I got another one from Derek. And it's just that, that automated aspect to it where it is, it's kind of like, it's making our lives a little bit easier where we wanted to be in these areas and it's showing us those, those types of things. Do you think it's easier or harder to buy a home today than it has been in the past? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, what we're really asking is, does today's real estate environment or does the market is it harder today or easier? And in some ways it's both, mm -hmm. right? Every market I really believe is is unique. Every market comes with its own challenges and every market comes with its own opportunities. I mean, if we look at the unicorn years of 2020 through the first quarter of 2022, um, that was a very challenging market for buyers and a, and a very lucrative market for yeah. sellers. I, people were getting two to three dozen offers on a listing. Uh, Within days, um, listings were going for more than list price. Uh, people were removing contingencies like inspections and appraisals. Um, today, our market's a little bit different. Uh, there, there still is very little inventory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, interest rates are a little bit higher. Um, uh, if if a property is marketed properly. Uh, agents are still able to get multiple offers, mm -hmm. um, so that's a that's a that's a challenging question to answer. I think a lot of it is going to really depend in depend on the buyer and specifically what they're looking for. Yeah. If they're looking for something in maybe the under five hundred thousand dollar price range, then it's probably going to be a challenge, mm -hmm. but but not impossible. Yeah. Um, and if they're looking for something that might be more luxury over seven figures. Mm -hmm. uh, as a buyer, you might find it a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a very fair answer to your no, question. No, it's kind of a trick question. And it really does elicit a lot of conversation that we have with people about things, if it's easier or harder. I like, obviously people know what I do. And so when I'm in different circles, I have conversations about this sort of thing with people. And they're conversations I love to, to have with people about it. So I'm more than happy to be able to do it. I, I think that in some ways it is easier to purchase a home today than it has been in the past from a financial side, in terms of there are programs where you don't have to put cash down. There's a lot of home 100% financing programs products. Those weren't available when I bought my right. first home in the, in the 2000s. Um, so those sorts of things that are there, you talk to a lot of people, they still think they need to put a substantial amount of cash down, but that's not necessarily the case. It is harder because home prices are more expensive. It can be, depending on the market, you talked about the unicorn years, it was very difficult to be able to get somebody to accept your offer. It wasn't yeah. It wasn't difficult to be able to go through and make the offer because at the time we had a plethora of cash that was available, but getting somebody to accept your offer was difficult. So I think it kind of goes back to the same thing, making sure that we understand your goals, what the strategy is, and then we can be able to put our best foot forward and whatever market we kind of find our way into, then we can make sure that we're putting um, putting all the resources that we can to be sure. able to, to help that out. I did uh, see something the other day, I have two things I wanted to mention on this. So I read an article on KSL where it talked about Nepo home buyers. And it said that 40% of home buyers under the age of 30 used a cash gift from a family member or inheritance. And mm -hmm. so that was something where I'm finding that parents are, and even grandparents are a lot more willing to uh, front some cash for a buyer to be able to help them. Sure. And there's lots of different ways that we can be able to utilize that sort of stuff. Somebody could still get that gift. They don't necessarily have to use it towards a down payment. It could be to improve the home. So there's lots of different ways that we can be able to do that, but I'm finding that people are getting creative uh, to be able to, to take care of uh, those home buying needs. The other thing, I was talking to an economist up at the University of Utah, and he said that Utah has 33,000 less homes than we need. Right. And when I heard that number, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, yeah. there's a, something, 33,000 less homes than what we need for that or for the, the individuals who are here. And he's like, that number is just continuing to grow. We went through, uh, a lot of things that I've looked at in the past of how, you know, what's happened with home buyers of my generation of people didn't really buy homes for a long time. And then you had Gen Z who were getting in the market to buy homes, but then millennials are like, wait, we want to buy homes too. So it's this weird 
thing that took place where we had so many people that are wanting to buy homes and then obviously the influx of people that we've had over the past few years people moving from out of state our in migration numbers have been huge you know backing up a little bit um, it's really interesting to hear what you shared about the willingness um, of parents or grandparents to to help uh, individuals get into maybe their first home mm -hmm. or maybe it's not um, I think that's that speaks you know very loudly of how important those individuals see home ownership mm -hmm. um, and their willingness to help them I actually had an interesting stat that I came across the other day it's a national number it's not a local number but it but it um, indicated that and this is this is according to the National Association of Realtors or NAR uh, they've indicated that 30 percent of Gen Z home buyers are transitioning directly from a relative's home into their own home. So skipping real quickly, so they're skipping moving out and renting, going Correct. straight from living with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa into a new home. Or, or perhaps, and, and, and in reading this, there were, there were other, other things there, but perhaps they made the decision that they did want to buy a home, so they stopped renting, mm -hmm. moved into a family member's home to save up money for a down payment. Yeah. Uh, something along those lines. We we do see down payments is sometimes a challenge for people. You know, mm -hmm. rents rents make it difficult yeah. sometimes to save money for a down payment. Um, although one thing that I would highly encourage is you know exploring down payment assistance programs. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some grants and different things out there yeah. uh, that might be available locally. I think um, the last I had heard nationally, there's over two thousand different types of grants available that yeah, people can use to get into home. Yeah, I know that people are getting creative, the types of conversations that I'm having with people. And it's not just young people. It's, uh, I had a conversation with somebody the other day who is 55 and they're looking at purchasing a home with their parents. Yeah. And I had another one the other day where um, the individual that was buying the home was in their early 70s and they were buying the home with their father who was basically in hospice. They wanted to move him home and right. they didn't have space. And so they decided to, to buy another home to be able to help him. And then they were thinking about their grandkids of moving in afterwards yeah. so that they could be able to save. So these conversations that I'm having with people are very abnormal but it's kind of becoming the norm to be creative in what we're what we're looking to multi generational do. housing is becoming very common and and if you think about it um it's probably a a, a very you know a, a very nice part of our future yeah um uh, you know there was a time when when we'd see people maybe they they were empty nesters and mm -hmm. they sold their house and they wanted to downside mm -hmm size and the conversation i'd often have with them in terms of where do you want to move is closer to my kids yeah. so i can be close to my grandkids yeah um and so why not in the in the same house if that's an option yeah, yeah. what's interesting to me is that in other cultures it's very normal to have multi-generations in a home yeah it seems like in our culture it's not but i feel like because of everything that's going on that's changing uh, much more rapidly than it has in the past i think about when i was growing up and it's like, okay, you move out between, you know, here in Utah, between the ages of 18 and 21, depending if you, you know, go out and do something. Uh, but it was very normal for you to be able to move out. Now it's kind of like, well, just stay here, be able to get, <laughs> and I think it is part of, uh, part of parenting that they want to help out a little bit more, maybe helicopter bulldoze a little bit, but also just being realistic with the marketplace and right. being like, hey, why would you want to pay $2,300 a month for rent in a townhome when you could be able to live here sure. for a couple of years? We look at that and I'm like, that person was able to save 50 plus thousand dollars in right. rent in just two years rather than paying $2,300. This actually brings up a question that somebody put in here. So they're talking about co-signers. Um, if we have two co-signers, one uh, which is a new home buyer, and one who isn't, would we still be able to qualify for a first time home buyer program? It depends on the program. Our programs that we have here at the credit union, the answer to that is yes. So as long as one person is a first time home buyer, then you can be able to utilize those programs that are available. Uh, sometimes we've had individuals who will try and put a parent on the loan or something like that. That can be a problem because it's what's called a non, um, my mind just went blank on what, what they're called. Owner occupied. They are not occupying the the home, but yes, uh, they're. Um, so if you have an individual who's co-signing, but they're not going to be in the home, uh, then 
those programs may not be available. That's where we can have a conversation, find out what you're trying to accomplish and what we're looking to do there. Um, another question that we have here is I got an individual who makes around 80,000 uh, annually and they feel like home ownership is unrealistic. Uh, watch rates and prices uh, over the past few years and saving up a down payment and worry if I don't stretch for a home, um, I'll be priced out. I'm curious if you have any clients uh, that in that income range and that have made it work and how. I'll touch base on this and then I'll let you sure. touch base on it as well. Um, I, I have seen that. There's actually a book by, um, of all people, Elizabeth Warren and her daughter. And I read that before I knew who Elizabeth Warren was and it's called The Two Income Trap. And it's a phenomenal book that talks about how economies can change to two incomes. So I look at $80,000 as, as a great income, but when the economy's changed to have a two income economy or two income um, in a household, they're looking at everything being based off of 160, not necessarily 80. Mm -hmm. And so it has it has created some problems. I I've been house poor a few times in my life, and I recommend that everybody be house poor at some point in their life <laughs> if it helps them get into a home. And the reason is, is that it's going to be difficult for you at times to be able to get into a home. You may have to stretch in ways that you're not comfortable doing, but the only way to really fight inflation is to fix your monthly costs. Right. And if you can fix those monthly costs, then that's something that it may be tough for you now, but in the future, it's going to be beneficial for you. Right. So there are things that are available to be able to help. There's a program called Home Ready, where if you make less than 84,000 as household income, you basically get the best rate available with the current pricing. Which I did one the other day and it saved somebody almost one percent in the wow, rate so it's a massive it could be a massive savings for them so there are things that are available we just need to start to look and, and see if there is anything available there yeah I I love this question um, and and I'm sure that there's lots of other people listening who are thinking wondering the same thing yeah. so I'm really glad that this uh, this person posed this question I I like to I like to come at it from a little bit of a different angle what's the alternative? If the alternative to home ownership is renting, then I would strongly encourage them to find a way to own. Mm -hmm. Even if it means starting out with maybe not your end goal in terms yeah. of a property. Um, I know we I know we all want to jump to the top of the ladder, mm -hmm. right? We all want to start with our dream home. Um, but sometimes it makes sense to take that ladder rung one rung at a time. Uh, maybe you know, your first home is going to need to be a condo. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, two years later or three years later, you're able to transition out of that condo and into a townhome. Yeah. And then maybe two or three years after that, you're transitioning out of that townhome and into a single family home. And now you're closer to that dream home. Here, here's the thing. When you are investing in a home, you need to remember that you're investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you're renting, you're investing in someone else, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna be paying a mortgage either way. Yeah. You're either paying your own mortgage or you're paying someone else's. When you're investing in someone else, at the end of the day, four years later, five years later, you have nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. If you're investing in a home and it's maybe still not that ideal home that you've always dreamed of, four or five years later, that home will have likely appreciated. Yeah, They have for the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's consistently homes have been going up. Um, you'll have been paying down that mortgage and you'll have equity, Yeah, you'll have net worth. And so I, again, I'm with you. I strongly encourage that person to, to reach out. The best person to talk to right now for them would be to talk to a lender, would be to talk to Taylor, to really explore kind of their financial world and to see mm -hmm. if home ownership is an option. Yeah. Um, as a realtor, I don't care if somebody is looking for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar condo or a million and a half dollar house. I do not care. I'm excited to help people to reach their goals. Um, so after talking to you, I'd love to talk to them as well. One thing that I noticed that went away about 10, eight, 10 years ago is the term starter home. Yeah, people just don't they they don't buy that that starter home nearly as much. And and part of that is just them getting creative where people would be living in an apartment and then they move from the apartment to a condo and, and then they sell that and possibly move into a home or a town home and then go into a home. That kind of went away. And I, I've looked at some statistics as well where people are getting creative. So they're living at home, but they're going from 
their uh, their parents' home into their forever home. Yeah. That's kind of a thing that's happened, but um, the starter home went away. I know one thing, I, I believe you shared it with me, um, but I was talking to somebody and we were talking about percentages of homes increasing. And if we're just looking at percentage, not dollar amount, but just percentage, condos were actually the highest amount yeah. for a, quite a few years where you were getting the best rate of return percentage wise yeah. in that. So when I talk to people and they're like, I, I don't want to live in a condo, I can completely understand that condo living is uh, much like apartment living. But at the same time, the rate of return that those people got was quite high. Yeah, definitely. Let me share a story. I think this is really interesting and, and I love real life. And this is a real story, although I will not share names. <laughs> Um, in 2018, I met a flight attendant. Uh, she wanted to get into her first home. Uh, she uh, was approved for not a large amount of money. Uh, it meant that she could only buy a townhome and to really make it comfortable, she decided she wanted to have roommates. Um, so she got into this townhome. Uh, she found two roommates. There were total three bedrooms. And two years later, it was working so well, she bought another townhome and moved out of that town home and rented out the other room and, and repeated. Mm -hmm. And a year later she repeated and a year later she repeated. And to this point, it's been what, five, almost six years. She now has six properties and she's living in a much nicer property today mm -hmm. than she was then. I know you talked about encouraging people to be house poor, but, and you've also used the word creative a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that that can be done, yeah. uh, even in you know a weird market like today, um, to allow you to get into home ownership and allow you to get onto that you know yeah. onto that path of of building wealth. Yeah. And while and from a lending perspective, we can't use that extra rent right uh, in in our approval process, but it still helps with the month to month cost and everything that's there. All of my friends are married. All of them have kids. We are kind of in this group. I'm 40 years old. I've got one friend who's single and I was talking to him about getting creative because he's constantly he's in sales commission jobs and he's bounced around to a lot of different industries, which has been difficult to be able to get him approved because you typically need a two year history. But every time that he goes to move into something else, I'm, he'll call me and be like, oh, I've got to move out by the end of the month. And I'm like, how do you keep getting booted out? Like, this is just so <laughs> weird. Like, I, he's a good guy. I know that he doesn't have problems or anything like that. And he's like, oh, I just moved in with my friends. Like, they have a room in the basement that's just sitting there. So I move in with them and I'll live there for four or five months and pay you know, six, 800 bucks a month. It's a heck of a lot cheaper for me. They get some extra coin in their pocket. Yeah. These are the types of things that people are getting creative with so yeah. that they can be able to help with their finances. Love it. Uh, last September, I did a webinar here at the credit union for buying and selling. And I feel we look at 13 months later, the markets have changed quite a bit from that time to right now with buying and selling. Uh, what challenges do you see for people from your perspective, and then I'll touch on my perspective with people that are looking to buy and sell. So not home, first time home buyers, these are people that own a home currently and then looking to buy a, another home to move into. Right, right, and and the super common thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest, the biggest challenge uh, today is timing. But guess what, that was the biggest challenge yesterday and it was the biggest challenge True. five years ago and it's always gonna be your biggest challenge. Biggest challenge when it comes to buying and selling simultaneously is timing. Uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a slightly different challenge is, is um, identifying what comes first. Uh, a lot of times when you are looking for a new home, that's a lot more exciting. And people sort of want to let that cart get in front of the horse a little mm -hmm. bit. I think in addition to um, figuring out your timing is really making sure that you've uh, that you've laid the groundwork ahead of time, uh, that you have uh, communicated with a professional realtor, you've done a very thorough market analysis, and you have a comparative market analysis of your home. Uh, you know what it is worth in today's market, what it would take to sell, and really importantly, what kind of net equity you could expect from it. From there, I think it's really important that you sit down with a with a lender and you share that information so that you can determine uh, what kind of home you're going to be looking for next. Mm -hmm. And and then 
you get everything done so that you could literally list your home tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, that pre-listing inspection, any repairs that need to be done, painting or carpet that need to be replaced. Uh, get the photographs taken care of. Get the brochures ready so that you can list that home at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Uh, because um, obviously, if you're selling to buy, um, you're going to have big goals and big dreams for what that next home looks like. Uh, that way, as you get out there and you start shopping around, you're you're not behind the eight ball, mm -hmm. as you put it earlier. Yep. You're in front of it, and and you're ready and capable of taking action immediately. Yeah, um, those are some of my thoughts. Um, but the challenges, they're not really any different than they used to be. Interesting. Um, uh, maybe a little bit with the financing side, and you yeah. probably could speak a lot more yeah. to that than I could. I'll touch base on that. Um, but you mentioned a couple things that I talk to people about. So when I, somebody gives me a call and they'll say, I'm looking to sell my home. You're my first call that I'm making. I want to buy another home. I talk about things, uh, ask them if they've met with a realtor. Uh, what is it going to take to sell your home? How much could you sell your home in its current condition? Could you do a little bit of elbow grease and put that into the home to be able to get it to sell for a higher amount maybe not necessarily a higher amount because if you're looking at selling in the summer of 2021 and then you went to the summer of 2022 because of the time frame that was there the market's different very so you just want to make sure that your home is at the forefront of people's uh my or eyes when they see it online the curb appeal those types of things that you can be able to do the other thing is talking to them about net equity there are closing costs to sell a home in terms of titling there are fees yeah. to sell a home with a realtor how much net equity are you actually getting out of that so that we can be able to move into the second part which is the financing aspect of it uh, to know how much is there uh, timing is always going to be difficult there's always going to be some anxiety that's there but we just want to make sure we get everything um, put in place so that you can be able to remove those as much as possible one thing that I've noticed that's been a big difference probably since 2018 2019 is that if somebody had a salary of 160 170 um, you have somebody who is looking to move into uh, downsize their home they're now empty nesters they're in the prime years of their income earnings and stuff like that that income because of how expensive homes are doesn't allow somebody just to buy the other home and sell that right that that has really changed because when you're getting into a home that let's say they can put 20 percent down and they're buying a home for uh seven hundred thousand dollars so they're getting a loan for you know five hundred and sixty thousand dollars that home payment may be forty five hundred dollars a month it might and so when we're looking at that sort of thing when all of a sudden we're looking at how much income they need to have just to be able to qualify for that uh, on top of what they're currently paying for their home, maybe some other debt that they have, it can be a challenge for them. And so th yeah. that's why we want to make sure that we know everything up front so that we can be able to start to overcome those obstacles. Yeah, there was a time and for some people, it might still be that time where you could buy the home first, then sell your existing home and then take the, the net equity from that, apply it to your mortgage, and what do you call that, reforecast It's it? a recasting. A recasting, yep. reforecast is yep. not the right word, but recast, I was yep. almost there. Yeah. But, um, and that might still work for some people today. It certainly was um, the ideal course of action uh, during those unicorn years that we talked about earlier. Uh, today, you're just gonna want to be extra cautious because it might take a little bit more work to sell your current home mm -hmm. than you think. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, really making sure that you've surrounded yourself with the right team, mm -hmm. uh, really making sure that you're very clear on the, on the current real estate environment. Uh, we don't, we don't want anybody to be surprised. Yeah. Uh, and we definitely don't want people having two mortgages unless their intention is to rent the, mm -hmm. the other home, the, the previous home instead. So let's talk about what recast is real quickly. Sure. So when somebody buys a home and they go through and they sell another home, they're able to put the equity from the, the home that they sold into the new property. And so a lot of times people are wondering, well, how is that going to benefit me with a recast? When they do that, we're able to adjust the payment as if they would have put that money down initially. So if you bought a home for $700,000, put the minimum down, you got $300,000 coming from your other property, you put that towards the new home, we're able to recalculate the payment as if you would have put that $300,000 down initially. So that's a free service that we offer here at the credit union. It really does remove a lot of the financial angst if you can be able to financially qualify. 
So we got another question from somebody. Um, they're about to graduate uh, with an engineering PhD. Congratulations on that. Uh, so the income is about to go from 30 to 80 in January. My partner makes about 90. James, can you move that arrow? Thanks, buddy. If we buy in March, uh, will my new income level be considered when applying for the mortgage? Or do I have to already be making the 80,000 for that to be considered? That's a really good question. So those are the things that we can be able to take a look at. I can't give you an answer on that that's just yes or no. There's a lot of things that depend on that. It is possible to maybe be able to do that. Um, we just have to look and see what the guidelines are in terms of what is in your offer letter. So if an offer letter has contingencies that, one thing that we see a lot that you have to take a drug test. And so that's one, if that's in there, no, we can't use the higher income. If there's no, if everything's removed, then we're on a path where we can be able to use that, that higher income for something like that. So that's something where we need to look at the guidelines and guidelines are ever changing with stuff that we have popping up. So those are some things that we wanna take a look at to make sure that we can be able to use that. So if that's the case, you wanna look at it now, let's have a conversation about it. I always go back to having a conversation, whether it be with a realtor, whether it be with myself, just call the person, have yeah. a conversation. We're available. Talk us through what you're looking for, what you're trying to accomplish. We can give our the information to you. It doesn't have to be something where we need to sit down and have a big, long conversation. We can just be able to go through, do some research, get back in touch just so that you have that. I know Derek's available all the time to be able to do that. I'm available to do that. We just want to be able to help you out with that information. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they just don't ask. They sometimes are maybe afraid or they jump to conclusions or they try to find their answers online. I just encourage them to go straight to the source. Yeah, agreed. Can you remember a market like this where we've got higher rates and higher home prices? Have you seen anything like this where you can be able to go back to no, something? No, not, not really. I mean, if you look at the 1980s, mm -hmm. I mean, we definitely had higher rates in the yeah. 1980s. Uh, um, I mean, neither of us owned homes then, mm -hmm. but we definitely lived in homes. And I yeah. can remember my parents almost like bragging about their 14% or 16% mm -hmm. interest rates. Yeah. But no, we this, this is a unique market. But really, if I look at every sort of market or real estate environment that we've had, you know, since 2000, they've all been really quite unique. Mm -hmm. um, but there's things that we can learn from previous uh, markets. Um, uh, I think the biggest lesson for me and the one I'm truly trying to remind people of is if you were to talk to someone that you knew owned a home in the 1980s and they had that 12 or 14 or 16% interest rate, if you ask them if they regretted owning a home there, then they'd all say no. Yeah. Because they've built incredible wealth yeah. uh, from, from that period of home ownership. I, I always like to ask people when I, um, I, I, I rarely ask them if they are happy that they bought a home because I, I pretty much feel like I know the answer to that. But yeah. I do ask people that I know that's stretched. And so they'll be looking at a home for 600,000, they end up buying a home at 725. And so I will run into them because I work at the Brickyard office and they'll come in and they'll pop their head in and say hi. And I'm, fortunately I've had this unique ability to remember not so much their face with their name, but I've been like, you bought the home on yeah. Alder and I know that you, you know, and I'll ask them like, are you happy that you stretched or what are your thoughts on that? And overwhelmingly, they are happy that they stretched because they were able to get into something that they, they loved. It was able to fit a lot, check a lot more of their boxes that they had. So while it is difficult sometimes to look at that, maybe $300, $400 more in mortgage payment, but I find that a lot of people are very, very happy with that. That's why I talk to people when they, I, I don't, I think it's good to get into something, even if you feel house poor, because you're eventually going to get out of it. It's not right. something that you're going to be in forever and you start to receive the benefits of it. It's interesting though. You, you touch on a, an interesting point and that is home ownership is a lot. It's about a lot more than just money and finances, mm -hmm. right? Home ownership is, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to be said for having your own home. And um, I just highly encourage it. Agreed. Okay, um, next question that I wanna talk about for first time home buyers. So what, mis what missteps do you see first time home buyers make that cause trouble for them? Um, I think one of the 
big initial missteps, and we've we've touched on this before, so I'm not going to go into it in much detail. Is is they don't talk to or establish a professional team soon enough. I think that that's really important. Um, I think knowing what what you're pre-approved for and having that pre-approved level is is really critical. Um, another mistake that a home buyer might make is listening to the wrong sources for information. Um, news and media. It's really interesting. I can do a Google search um, and find 10 articles on home ownership in 2023 and five of them are touting it as the most important thing and the best thing you could do and five of them are telling you that you're absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes they approach friends and family um, who may not always be the best source of yeah. advice. I, I'm not trying to get in, in between you know, yeah. yeah, between somebody and their family, but but really, really, if you're if you're serious about considering home ownership, I encourage you to talk to, to professionals. I think the biggest mistake, the absolute biggest mistake that home buyers are making today is that they're giving up. Mm. Don't give up. Yeah. It it breaks my heart. Yes, it home ownership comes with challenging yeah. challenges. Buying a home, it's hard regardless of what market that you're in but emotionally yeah. it's a very difficult uh, it's going to be a roller coaster ride and um a good team can help to to maybe minimize some of those peaks and valleys in in the roller coaster or if you really like roller coasters we can try and make them more, more <laughs> I don't extreme think you like those roller <laughs> but you know what i mean yeah. but but don't give up yeah. um it, you know that's probably the the, the biggest mistake that i'm that I'm seeing. I think when you said get a professional team around you, I, I think that just kind of sums up all my thoughts on that. And I think I see people, especially first time home buyers, they lose sight of their goals where they may be looking in the summer and they make four or five offers and they're all turned down. And one of the things that I saw, and I, I don't even believe it uh, from what I was being told, I think it was just an easy catchphrase to be able to give people. But Anytime somebody was missing out on a home in 2020, 2021, it was because somebody offered all cash. Hmm. Not every single home was purchased with no. all cash. So it kind of became that thing where people were looking at, it's like, oh yeah, if you're trying to buy a home, you're going to get outbid with somebody with, with all cash. And so that may have been the case where they missed out on a couple of those. And they're like, I want to take in a break because emotionally they just couldn't be able to handle right. it anymore. But then what do they do? They upgrade their car. All of a sudden their <laughs> car payment goes from 320 to $460 a month. And that can greatly diminish how much they can be able to qualify for a yeah. home. So they lose sight of their goals and what they're really, really wanting to accomplish. And they may think, oh, it's only $140. That's really not that big of a deal. Well, when we're looking through and seeing how much you can be able to qualify for, that might be $25,000, dollars $40,000 less that they could be able to qualify for before. It puts them in a completely different category of home that they're looking at. So I think, yeah, getting that professional team and making sure that you're focused on what you're trying to accomplish and then looking for creative solutions to be able to overcome. If you do miss out on a home, why did you miss out on a home? Having somebody who is a professional to be able to help them where they're just not – the seller's agent may say, well, somebody offered cash. And that's where I'm saying that I'm like, I don't believe that all these homes were being purchased with cash. And some of them were, but not all of them were being purchased with cash. And I know from my perspective where somebody, a cash deal may be that they're taking cash out of their primary residence to be able to buy. So it is a cash deal, but it's not a cash deal. Yeah. Those are all things that kind of go into it where we can be able to say, well, this is probably why we missed out on this home. We can be able to overcome it with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. One of the things I like to talk to people about is making sure that they understand with their professional team is that how can we be able to make the strongest offer possible that doesn't cost them any money? Because yeah. it's not always about the highest offer that you're making on a home. I know one home that we went and looked at, the individual was had already moved. They worked for Boeing. They were moving to Seattle. The spouse and child were still living in the home. They wanted a quick closing. That's yeah. what was most important to them. And so obviously they're not going to accept your offer that's maybe $25,000 less than the other offer. But if you're within $5,000, $10,000, but you have everything ready to go, that may be the difference where you can be able to close quickly. If we are putting 45 days on a contract, when somebody wants to close quickly, when we don't need that just because it makes us feel good, those are the things that can be able to get us in trouble. We wanna make yeah. sure that each situation we're looking at it, 
you do a really good job of talking to the others other agents especially at open houses kind of get some intel what i think that's for? critical i think that it is so important that an agent just picks up the phone and calls the other agent mm -hmm. it's not it's it why would you shoot from the hip yeah find out what's important to the seller i mean we just we just had a closing last week together yeah uh first time home buyers and uh and it was a multiple offer situation yeah. on that home and uh, I was able to get on the phone with the other agent and ask her very specifically, what is the seller looking for? We were able to put that right into our initial offer. Mm -hmm. Did that help our client's offer to stand Absolutely. out against the other offers? It did. Yeah. And we won, we won the listing. And, and did we put things into that offer that um, enhanced the offer, made it more valuable to the seller, but didn't increase the out of pocket or even any financial cost to our client. Yes, we did. Well, talk about that because I thought that was really interesting. With this one, we had a conversation that the offer was at 350. We were looking, we ran numbers up at 375 and you ended up not being at that, but what did? What was the creative solution that you had to be able to win that deal? We did a couple things. Um, one was it was really important for this individual to stay in the home for a certain period of time the after we closed, correct. And and so we accommodated that. Uh, that was one of the things. Um, and probably the 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 biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there's other things that you can do. Uh, for instance, within an offer, there are deadlines. Yeah. Right. We're gonna have. Uh, a due diligence deadline and a financing and appraisal deadline and those typically have different dates and they're the scariest deadlines for a um, for a seller um, once you get past those deadlines they can be assured that the home is going to sell so the shorter those deadlines the better mm -hmm. um, you know one of the things that that I did with this one and, and that I do with all of my buyers is we called ahead I uh, had an inspection already scheduled um, before we even submitted the offer so that we were able to do the due diligence deadline yeah. in a matter of days instead of that traditional 10 to 14 days. Mm -hmm. um, that was really enticing to uh, the seller. So there's different things that we can do to be creative. Um, but all of that really starts with um, a conversation with the other with the other agent, really understanding the the other the other side. Um, that way we're able to to construct an offer that right up front is very close to a win-win mm -hmm. uh, in the case of this last transaction it didn't we didn't even get a counter offer yeah i mean it just it just was uh, perfect for them yeah you're able to you're kind of doing pre-negotiating prior to like hey what are you really looking for and then you get that information by having a conversation with them and then you can be able to put it into your offer so once again it's not just a money factor it's those other things that you're talking about so that you could be able to um, get to what the seller really wants um, and in this situation it was just really making sure that they had the flexibility because of the situation that they were right. they were currently in yeah uh, what is happening in the housing market that people are not seeing what's something that you're you may be seeing today when we say today we're talking about like in the last 30 days that maybe we weren't seeing 90 days ago and mainstream just hasn't caught up to what's going on. One of the things that I constantly hear from people is that they're worried to get into the marketplace because they have to overpay for homes. And I'm like, that was the case, but that's no longer the case. So they, they've got 18 month old information uh, of what's just stopping them from that right. moving forward. Well, and I think, I mean, I mean, you just hit the nail somewhat on the head. I think a lot of times, um, people who you know don't work in the industry who aren't exposed to it every day uh, they might be working with antiquated information right um, they might make assumptions like oh i can only buy a house if i have 20 percent down well we know that that's not true but they may not know that's not true they may be making assumptions that the only way to get into a house is to offer more than list price well that may have been the case at one time that net isn't necessarily mm -hmm. the case today or they may be hearing some of these crazy, really negative, you know, um, marketing pieces of, about our market and assume that they can offer 10 or 20 or 30 percent less than list price and get into a house. Well, that's not true. So I think education is, mm -hmm. is certainly key for a lot of people. Um, I can tell you that right now in Salt Lake County, um, it's a 
it, honestly, I feel like it's just such a great time to either buy or sell. For the first time in a long time, we're leaning more towards a neutral market than we have in a decade. Mm -hmm. You know, we have been flipping back and forth from, like if you look at the, the recession years, um, it was such a buyer's market. It was so hard on sellers. And then, and then almost overnight it flipped and it became a seller's market and it was an extreme seller's market in 2020 and 2021, even sort of the first half, all of the first quarter of 2022. Um, and then it kind of flipped again into somewhat of a buyer's market because there was a lot of fear mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of 2022. Right now, I feel like it's a little bit more of a neutral market. Um, you know, anybody can call me, we can talk stats. You know mm -hmm. me, I love numbers. Yes, I, I always know uh, what's going on in, in, in the market and, and by usually by city and county and mm -hmm. state as a whole. Um, but right now, um, it's, a, it's a very good time for people to be considering things. Everything that we talked about kind of goes back to those things that you answered that make sure you have a professional team and to be able to answer those questions that you have and what we're seeing in the marketplace and everything that goes along with that. Um, Derek, I really appreciate you um, answering the questions and just having this conversation. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know, I'm going to be sending out an email that has Derek's information and my information on it. If you have any questions, you can be able to reach out to us. I know I'm available until 11 p.m. seven days a week. I don't know if you put a time on it like I do, but I know if somebody <laughs> calls and you're awake and available that you'll, I you'll always answer. Yeah. Um, and so those are, we, we want to be available for people. We want to be there to be able to help them. Um, I really enjoy this information, but really getting to all of it, is, it sounds like things that we already knew between the two of us. You really just need to have a professional team around here, around you to ask you questions, find out where you're at, so that we can be able to put you on the right path to move forward and hopefully our services will be the services that you need and if not that we can be able to put you in touch with whomever we need to to be able to make sure you get taken care of absolutely so um if you have any other questions uh we'll be sending out an email that's got our uh, cell phone numbers our email addresses on them you can be able to reach out by a email text a call so that we can be able to get you taken care of i really appreciate the time and questions that everybody sent uh, out today and i hope you have a great day